This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More about them later. Meet White. In the fall of 2020, White decided to embark on a nuzlocke of probably her favorite game, Pokemon White. The circumstances that drove her to start such a tedious and time-consuming journey is anyone's guess. But over the course of the next few months, she would expertly work her way through Unova, felling each threat that stood in her way. As with many nuzlocks, there were highs and lows, friends made and friends lost. By the turn of the new year, White had collected all eight badges and was well on her way to the Pokemon League where she would defeat the Elite Four and Team Plasma, successfully completing a hard-fought Nuzlocke challenge. But then, something happened. Something that happens to many Nuzlockers. White abandoned her run. She sold her cartridge to a local used game vendor, and that was that. She had turned her back on her friends, who were now doomed to exist in the purgatory of an abandoned save file, never allowed to die, but never knowing if they'd again see the light of day. And for three long years, they didn't. They knew nothing but darkness until one fateful day, March 22nd, 2024, when a hapless young man decided to spend an exorbitant amount of money on a used copy of Pokemon White. And do you know who that young man was? No, it wasn't me, it was Papa C, but I was right next to him. And after reacting to all of the used Pokemon games that Papa C had recklessly purchased at PAX East, I knew that White's Nuzlocke was special. She had come so close. Her death box told a story that deserved an ending. And so, with the help of Uncle Jim Tendo, I decided that I was gonna finish White's Nuzlocke or die trying. The rules for this challenge were simple. In addition to the standard hardcore Nuzlocke rules, I decided that I wouldn't be allowed to catch any new Pokemon, and I wouldn't be allowed to do any calcs. So the first thing I did was take stock of my available Pokemon. In our party was Quavid the Bear Tick, Zuko the Darmanitan, Harold the Seismitoad, Pichan the underleveled Tranquil, Ross the even more underleveled Ferrisseed, and a Larvesta egg. White's box was fairly solid, and a few Pokemon immediately caught my eye. Thor the Throw shows potential as a bulky fighting type, Sia the Litwick, classic Litwick name, will evolve to the always reliable and extremely powerful Chandelure, which will help me deal with Marshall's fighting types, Caitlyn's psychic types, and if we've got enough speed, Chantel's ghost types. There's also Leonard the Pawniard, whose dark steel typing is phenomenal into the Elite Four, though with the tragically low level cap of 50, Leonard won't be able to evolve into Bisharp. But perhaps the single most interesting Pokemon in this box is Baconator the level 7 Tepig, because that means that White had the cojones to immediately box her starter at the beginning of the Nuzlocke like an absolute badass. Respect. In the death box, we find six Pokemon, all encounters that we can do without other than one notable exception in the form of Nigel the Crocorock, which is frankly one of the absolute best Pokemon you could possibly have in the Unova late game. Dark types in general are incredible against the Elite Four, but Crocodile is among the best thanks to its speed and power. No Scrafty or Exadrill in the box is also a rough shake, but I gotta make do with what White left me. After very little thought, I settle on the team of Quavid the Bear Tick, Zuko the Darmanitan, Harold the Seismitoad, Ross the Ferrothorn, Boof Lad the Bufalon, and Sia the soon-to-be Chandelure. The first four were chosen to honor what appears to be White's vision for her team. Boof Lad was a personal choice because I've never used a Bufalon before, and Sia came to give my otherwise extremely fighting type weak team a fighting chance against Marshall, no pun intended. Just kidding, the pun was absolutely intended. Adopting another trainer's team is a tricky gambit. There's no shared history. You lack the comfort that only comes from a playthrough's worth of battles, so it's kinda like driving someone else's car. There's a bit of an adjustment period until you're firing on all cylinders, and my adjustment period just so happens to coincide with the final fight against Charon. He leads with Unpheasant, and I lead with Quavid. The ugly duck preps up a razor wind as Ice Bear lands a nasty super effective icicle crash, though that leaves our foe with just a sliver. Wanting to be a bit cute, I switch to Sia, who's immune to Razor Wind, but that ends up being a mistake, because on the following turn, Unpheasant lands an Air Slash for a huge chunk of damage, and a flinch. I 100% should have just stayed in with Quavid, but as I said, using someone else's team is like being on a boat. I'm still getting my sea legs. I thought you said it was like driving a car! Hey, shut up! I decide to bring in Boof Lad, who much more readily eats an Air Slash. After a turn of detecting, for no reason, 
Unpheasant hits a taunt, and then Booflad finally takes the KO with a Fachade. Samurott is second, and anticipating a revenge, which Sharon Samurott doesn't actually know, I switch to Harold. Unfortunately, we come in on a critical hit Aqua Tails, so... Pack it up, Harold. You did good, King. Ross comes in on a slash, and with the combo of her Iron Barb's ability and held Rocky Helmet, Samurott takes a solid chunk of his HP, though some of that is recovered with leftovers. Nevertheless, we've got this matchup in the bag, because after tanking another soft Aqua Tail, we can get an easy kill with a Power Whip. And now we simply hit this. Not gonna lie, folks. This could be going a little bit better. Okay. Well, Ross, I'm not gonna lie, buddy. That was abysmal. That was an abysmal performance, Ross. In fact, I think if Samrod had crit that Aqua Tail, you would have died. That was embarrassing. Simiseer, great. Um, okay. You got flash fire? Shit. Against Simiseer, I switch to Zuko, who eats the resisted flame burst. A second one brings our Fire Nation Prince into the yellow, and our follow-up hammer arm only does about 60%, meaning it's time to dodge a crit. Flame burst number three comes out, and Zuko hangs on in the red, getting the kill with his second hammer arm. Way to clutch up, Zuko. All that's left is Liopard, so it's back to Booflad on another nasty critical hit Night Slash. But since Liopard doesn't get a crit with the second Night Slash, Booflad lives to take the kill with a revenge and win our inaugural battle completely deathless. With that, we can make our way deeper into Route 10 and talk to this furtive fella who gives me the Dusk Stone needed to fully evolve Sia into Chandelure. And then after a few quick and painless battles against the very few mandatory trainers on Victory Road, we arrive hey. at the Pokemon League where the- Hey! What? Aren't you forgetting something? What's going on? It's Flygon HG from the past. And I'm here to talk to you about the sponsorship of this video, Squarespace, an online- Wait, 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 you are absolutely not past Flygon. Why do you think that? Well, for one, your background is different, so I'm not sure why you'd think nobody would notice that. But also, this doesn't make any sense. What, you did half of a Squarespace ad read in the middle of a Twitch stream? Is that what you're trying to sell here? Oh, so instead of committing to the bit and hoping that no one cares enough to comment on some obvious continuity errors, you thought that it would be better to point it out with some cloying Deadpool-esque meta dialogue between two present-day versions of yourself. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. Using their brand new guided design system, Squarespace Blueprint, you can choose from curated layouts and styling options to create a distinguished and professional online presence from the ground up. And I think I know a thing or two about being professional. Squarespace Blueprint makes the perfect website for whatever your brand or business is, and it optimizes the site for every device. Plus, with integrated SEO tools, your passion project will show up more often to more people. I use Squarespace to create and operate poppyhg.com, the only destination to find curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. And with Squarespace's video collection feature, now there's a whole video library for your viewing pleasure. Poppy. <laughs> With additional features like analytic information about the traffic of your website and online stores to help monetize your passion, you're sure to get the most out of your Squarespace subscription. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby or Corgi, then you should check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. After just a bit of prep, the team's all ready to face off against the Elite Four. I learned a lot from my near disaster that was that Charon fight, so I'm feeling 100% confident that my six expertly chosen Pokemon have what it takes to beat the Elite Four, and everything will go exactly according to plan. Alright, let's see if we can kill this sucker. Alright. 
Nice, we one-shot that. Okay, well, if we one-shot that, we probably one-shot everything else, if I had to guess. Musharna? We might not one-shot this. It might have Shadow Ball, right? Well, as they say in the industry, yo low. Uh-oh. Uh-oh! Uh-oh! Oh! <laughs> what? <laughs> no! Oh my god! <laughs> well, that's not great. But, I mean, like, what are the odds of that happening, you know? The good news is that Zuko can take the kill with two fire punches after Caitlyn heals her Musharna. Against Gothitelle, I bring in Ross, who resists Psychic and puts five minutes ago Ross to shame by successfully connecting with two power whips, the latter of which crits. Perhaps I judged her too harshly. Last is Sigalyph, so I bring in my bulky bovine Booflad on an Air Slash. On the following turn, he tanks a nasty Psychic, but then connects with a Mega Horn for roughly 50%. Then it's a switch to Quavid, and there's no way around it. I gotta dodge another crit here. That's what happens when you do very little planning and play with the reckless abandon that only comes when you haven't invested hours into a playthrough and you're piloting a team that isn't yours. In a way, it's the rawest form of nuzlocking, I suppose. Fortunately, Sigalyph ain't as lucky as her now deceased teammate and Quavi dodges the crit, meaning that she can take the final kill of the fight with an icicle crash. Losing Sia means that our Marshall matchup is significantly, and I mean significantly worse, so I plan to take him on last. Grimsley is our next target, and I pray that this goes a bit better than against Caitlyn. For his lead Scrafty, I lead Harold, because with Drain Punch, we can deal solid super effective damage, though Scrafty is quite bulky, and Sand Attack makes things a little less reliable. Fortunately, Harold pulls through, connecting with both of his next two Drain Punches for the KO. That brings in Crocodile, so I switch to Ross, the perfect guaranteed counter to Grimsley's Gator. It's a lot of damage. Trust the process, Rossi. We're, we're just, we're just, we're not getting crit here. We're just not getting crit. I'll tell you that right now. See? Rossi hits the power whips when it matters. Nice. Good job, Ross. Good job, Rossi. <laughs> With Bisharp out third, it's back to Harold. X Scissors does big damage, but without his purple crayon weighing him down, Harold's fast enough to nail Bisharp with a drain punch that doesn't get the Oko, but recovers enough HP that Night Slash won't kill. And since Grimsley heals with a few full restores, another handful of drain punches brings our boiled boy back to full HP, meaning that all he's gotta do is snuff out Grimsley's Liopard. She tries to appeal to Harold's romantic sensibilities with an attract, but it doesn't work. At first. Liopard's sexy tricks eventually prove too much for Harold to handle, so ultimately it's Booflad who comes in on another critical hit Night Slash, and then takes the kill with Revenge. That's two Elite Four members down, and two to go. Chantel is next, and my answer to her is a haphazardly organized attempt at a belly drum sweep with Zuko. Against Kofagrigus, Zuko drums her belly to have her HP and max out her attack, activating a citrus berry that should prevent the KO as long as the dummy mummy doesn't get a critical hit, and she doesn't. So with that, we can take the kill with a plus six fire punch. Now this does effectively remove Zuko's sheer force ability thanks to mummies, so our next few hits will be significantly less powerful. But thankfully with payback, Zuko still has more than enough juice to get the one shots on Chantel's remaining three spirits. Which means that it's time to face off against Marshall with zero fighting type resistances and three fighting type weaknesses. There is no way that this isn't going to be a total disaster. Deathless is 100% out of the question, but maybe, just maybe, we can make it through this. Marshall leads with Throw, and I lead with Herald. With Surf Spam, we're able to best the Red Muppet in the ring, but that's already one out of our only two Pokemon without a Fighting-type weakness down into the yellow. And since Herald's my only real answer into N's Reshiram, I can't afford to sack him in this fight, meaning that someone's gonna need to eat a hit from Sock. 
My choice is Ross, who graciously takes less than 50% from a karate chop on the Switch. The nasty combo of Iron Barbs and Rocky Helmet once again takes a massive chunk of Sock's HP, so on the following turn, I simply dodge another critical hit from Karate Chop, Sock falls to roughly 50%, and Rossi takes a snooze to get all the way back to full HP. From here, I switch to Zuko, who eats yet another Karate Chop, and then takes the kill with a speedy Fire Punch on the following turn. But that brings in Conkeldor third, and here's where things start to get rough. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go Herald. Okay? Hear me out. Should have definitely had Rain Dance on this. This was stupid. He's gonna miss a Stone Edge. Okay, he's gonna not crit a Stone Edge. Good. All right. Now, we're gonna rest. Yeah. And he's gonna, he's gonna go for a stone edge again because he sees the kill now. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay. No, this is, this is, this is good. This is good, this is good, this is, that's that's not great that's not that that was not great um okay did i not give zuko an item okay new plan see a chump <laughs> okay 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 we're good we're golden we're good well actually that's not necessarily true at all but we'll see so you're gonna go out in a blaze of glory. Actually, you're gonna flinch. You're gonna you're gonna flinch this. You're gonna make him flinch. 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 Miss. Mi Damn it. With Quavid managing to charm Conkelder before going down, we do have a chance here. I bring in Booflat to nail the bulky bozo with a head charge, though sadly the creatine clown hangs on with a sliver, meaning that a hammer arm brings Booflat down into the yellow. And since Marshall will now heal, we've got no choice but to fire off two more head smashes, accruing massive amounts of recoil in the process. Booflat does survive the matchup, but as Mian Chao comes out last, there's nothing I can do to save him. Well, had I known Marshall was going for a U-turn, I actually could have saved Booflad's life, but I have to imagine that that was a completely random move. Nevertheless, from here, I've got basically one last chance, and it completely hinges on whether Zuko is faster than Mian Xiao, because if he's not, we are totally screwed. You need to be faster here, Chief. You really need to be faster. Yes, he's faster! Okay, one shot, please 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 one shot. No! No, Zuko! He has another full restore. All right. Now there's only one answer. Zuko, I'm sorry I didn't give you a charcoal. That was stupid, buddy. 96. Okay, okay, okay. So he will actually be faster after a bulldoze. So we can bulldoze here. How much does bulldoze do? 90 base power. Okay, 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 okay. So here's the play. There's no way we survive a jump kick. We gotta go Pharaoh for Chip. Thank you for your service, Ross. Oh. Absolutely fucking brutal, man. But we did it! <laughs> Harold lives. Harold lives. With that, the Elite Four has been defeated. And graciously, since this is Pokemon White instead of Pokemon White 2, there's no champion fight here. Instead, it's the two back-to-back -back fights with N and Getsis. But the nice thing about that is that we can access the PC and even leave the Pokemon League before taking them on, meaning that I can dispose of the five dead bodies in my party and build a brand new team. Joining Harold for the final fights of this challenge are Peachan the Unpheasant, Derpfisk the Stunfisk, 
Baconator the Embor, Thor the Throw, and Sakura the Sawsbuck. Are Pichan and Derpfisk the best choices for these final fights? No, ab absolutely not. But despite losing five Pokemon against the Elite Four, I was feeling arrogant and reckless. Surely this rinky-dink vanilla Nuzlocke wouldn't be enough to stop me, Flygon HG, the world's best Nuzlocker with a PhD. Is that even true? I don't know, but probably. This arrogance, or rather this confidence, is also why I decided to keep the level cap at 50 instead of the more standard 52, which would have matched N's Reshiro. Ram. But I mean, two levels? That's not gonna matter, right? So with our B squad assembled, it's time to save White's Nuzlocke once and for all. N is first and he leads with the legendary Reshiram. The lone survivor of the Elite Four is my choice for a lead, and he handily eats a resisted fusion flare before retaliating with a bulldoze for just shy of 50%. But the speed drop means that Harold can now outspeed and fire off another bulldoze, and that one high rolls, cleanly killing N's powerful ace. Kling Klang is second, so I keep firing away with bulldozes. Since N merely opts for metal sound and bulldoze two shots, that's another quick notch in Harold's kill belt. But Vanillix does come out third, so I have to bring in Baconator on a nasty blizzard. The Frozen Dessert moves first to set up Hail, but that's all he'll be able to do, because Baconator goes for a flame charge that does massive damage, and gives him the speed boost needed to take a quick kill on the following turn. Karakost is fourth, so that's an easy pivot into Sakura on a waterfall. And with N's Hail breaking his turtle sturdy, a quad effective Horn Leech gets a clean KO on the following turn. A fully exposed Zorark comes in fifth, so it's off to Thor on a really nasty Focus Blast. But in order for N to get the KO here, he's gonna need to connect with another Focus Blast and get the crit, which certainly won't happen. R right? Great, so Thor gets the kill with a revenge, leaving N with his final Pokemon, Archeops. And we've got just the counter for him. Derpfist comes in on a resisted, but still brutal acrobatics. With that though, we've got it. Dragon Claw hardly bruises Derpfisk, and then with an electric gem boosted Thunderbolt, she gets the clean KO and victory is ours. So all that's left is one last fight against Getsis. And after how simple N was, surely, surely this maniacal megalomaniac will be a walk in the park. He leads with Kofagrigus, and I again bring in Harold. An instant switch to Pichan means that she gets nailed by a Toxic, but better her than Harold. On the following turn, I go to Derpfisk as Getsis tries to use Protect for some Toxic stall, but two can play at that game, Bucko, and Derpfisk is as toxic as they come. Now, unfortunately, Getsis has a few full restores, so I can't just wait for Toxic to take him out. Instead, I gotta deal the finishing blow before he falls into healing range. A switch to Sakura on a Shadow Ball, followed by a switch to Pichan on a Toxic, means that Kofagrigus is indeed rapidly approaching that dangerous healing range. A third switch to Herald on a Soft Psychic, followed by an additional chunk of HP lost to poison damage, sets us up perfectly to finally take the kill with a Surf but Harold comes up just short, meaning that he too gets poisoned before Getsis' first Pokemon falls. That was... not good. Three Pokemon badly poisoned is not where you want to be. Buffalant is second, so I decide to stay in for a turn and deal damage with Drain Punch, but it's not nearly enough to two-shot, even after the recoil from a massive head charge. As one of our fastest Pokemon, Harold does still have some benefit, so instead of sacking him, I switch to Pichan and get massively lucky by coming in on a random Earthquake, because that means that we can hit the Bison with an Aerial Ace, and even though it's nowhere near enough for a KO that would have saved Pichan's life, it is enough for the recoil from one Wild Charge and our Held Rocky Helmet to bring the bulky beast down with us. Pichan may not have been the best bird, but she was far from useless. And as an unpheasant, that's the best you can ask for. I bring in Derpfisk to bait out Seismitoad. This should give me a fairly safe switch to Sakura on a muddy water, though Seismitoad opts for Rain Dance instead. But it's not a big deal because even with Swift Swim activated, our Timid Doe is still faster and able to get the clean KO with a Horn Leech. Unfortunately, that brings out Getsis' Ace Hydreigon, and sadly, Sakura's not faster than him. To make matters worse, Hydreigon knows Focus Blast, which is enough for a clean one-hit kill. 
all of a sudden, we're in a lot of trouble. The combination of Focus Blast, Dragon Pulse, Surf, and Fire Blast hit all of our Pokemon for massive damage. And since we saw that Hydreigon outspeeds Sakura, he also outspeeds the rest of my team. Well, actually, he doesn't outspeed Harold in the rain thanks to our Swift Swim, but in the moment, I thought it best to bring in Thor because he can just tank a Surf and get the clean KO with a 120 base power revenge. Except he can't. And that proves to be my ultimate downfall. Because Getsis heals on the following turn, and with revenge only at 60 base power, we don't even do 50%. And now that the rain has expired, Harold no longer outspeeds, so we no longer have a way to quickly take out Hydreigon. Basically, immediately bringing in Thor after Sakura went down, instead of first going to Harold and chipping with Drain Punch, was a colossal throw. Let me rephrase that so you can fully appreciate the irony of this situation. I threw the match by throwing to throw. I simply underestimated Hydreigon's bulk, or overestimated Thor's power, and as a result, we're as good as dead. Derp Fist comes in against Hydreigon and actually manages to survive a rainless surf, but her paltry established revenge isn't enough to finish off Hydreigon either, further driving the nail into our coffin. And if that wasn't enough, what happens next is even more brutal, because Baconator also does survive a super effective surf, but even with Blaze active, a flame charge isn't enough to get that last little tick of HP. This might seem like a throw on top of a throw from yours truly since Brick Break would have obviously killed, but it's really not a throw. Getsis still has two Pokemon after Hydreigon, one of which is Bisharp who would have come out next and outsped to kill Baconator without that speed boost from Flame Charge. So that was really my only out there, but since Hydreigon survived and still outspeeds, my not so little piggy falls, and once again I'm left with just Herald. I'm not gonna try and do a pump fake here, yes Hydreigon does miss a fire blast and we can take the kill with a drain punch, but the toxic damage is still gonna kill us before Harold can take out Getsis' remaining two Pokemon. There's a moment of hope where I think that drain punching Bisharp could give us back enough HP to somehow beat Electros, but we don't even get the one hit kill and Bisharp rudely crits a Night Slash to officially seal our fate. That right there is another classic Flygon HG whiteout in the final fight of the run. No matter how many times this happens, it still feels awful. But at least this time, there's still hope. Because even with 17 deaths, we have enough encounters in the box to put together a C-team and take another stab at Getsis. And now's certainly not the time to take the high road, so I also decided to bump the level cap up to 52. I honestly think that if we had those two extra levels on all my Pokemon, we would have won that first fight. But anyways, my new squad consists of Chika the Kofagrigus, Ming the Mianxiao, Shiro the Stoutland, Leonard the Bisharp, Seaweed the Levani, and Karen the Behiem. Honestly, some of these fellas absolutely should have been on Team B. Or even Team A. But nevertheless, this squadron of six is our last stand. Our very last hope of saving White's Nuzlocke. The good news is that we no longer need to fight N, so I can much better prepare for the matchup against Just Getsis. The bad news is that I still don't have a great answer into Hydreigon. But first up is that pesky Kofagrigus, though with Leonard Steel typing, we no longer need to worry about toxic damage. In fact, Leonard hardwalls Kofagrigus, easily taking the KO with a few Night Slashes and wasting one of Getsis' precious full restores in the process. Once the coffin goes down, Leonard's quad weakness to Focus Blast immediately brings out the three-headed dragon. So this is where we make a vital sacrifice in the form of Shiro the Stoutland. Hydreigon connects with a Fire Blast for roughly 50%, and then a Dragon Pulse finishes him off on the following turn. RIP, bud. But this gives me the safe switch to Karen, and Karen's sole job is to take a hit from the monstrous Ace, and then paralyze him with Thunder Wave. A slow Hydreigon is much less imposing, though because Karen's move pool is a glorified puddle, we've got nothing better to do than hit him with a Shadow Ball. The special defense drop is certainly nice, though it doesn't stop Karen from going down to a Surf. But with her Noble Sacrifice, Ming can come in for free and cleanly kill Hydreigon with a Jump Kick. Right? 
Okay, well, that was a crit, but I'm pretty sure that would have got the kill anyways. Ming is much stronger than Thor, and he barely missed out on the kill with a slightly higher base power move. With Buffalant out third, I U-turn for yet another crit and switch to Leonard. Head Charge still does a solid chunk of damage, though the recoil means that Buffalant should be in range to a brick break, but he's not. There's a two-letter price to pay for Uncle Jim Tendo's method of leveling up Pokemon, and for seemingly the hundredth time this run, coming up just short of the KO means that my Pokemon falls. Ming can again come in and get the revenge kill with another jump kick, so Gatsis and I are tied at three Pokemon apiece as he brings in Electros. U-turn does another chunk of damage as I switch to Chika on a strong wild charge. This changes our foe's ability from Levitate to Mummy, but it doesn't really matter since we don't have any ground type moves anyways. A switch back to Ming on a resisted crunch means that I can safely take another chunk of Electros's HP with a second U-turn, though the mummy interaction unfortunately means that we don't get the regenerator recovery. Nevertheless, with Chika eating another wild charge and then promptly laying down his undead life as Electros hits a crunch, Ming comes back in and takes his third kill of the match. Once again, it's all tied up at 2v2, but Seismitoad's not a problem. A U-turn to Seaweed on a resisted earthquake means that we can take an easy kill with a Leaf Blade on the following turn. Just like that, Getsis is down to his final Pokemon, Bisharp. But with a completely free switch back to Ming on a resisted Stone Edge, our speedy Weasel takes his fourth and final kill with a Drain Punch, at long last defeating Getsis, and finally saving White's Nuzlocke. I want to give a huge shout out to Papa C for having the financial recklessness to purchase so many used copies of different Pokemon games. And I want to give a huge shout out to Elfgar for working directly with Uncle Jim Tendo so that I could record this challenge on my very real Nintendo DS. Without them, this video wouldn't be possible. Hanging out with Papa C and Gar at PAX East was an absolute blast, and honestly one of the coolest parts of this job is getting to meet so many incredibly kind and wonderful people. If you enjoyed this concept, let me know by leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. And then go trade in your used copies of Pokemon games, I guess. Because maybe next time, I'll be saving your Nuzlocke. But statistically, probably not. Bye!